church. We are glad you're here. <clears throat> I'm going to try to make it through with a voice today. And I, I grabbed a water bottle and I don't even know where I put it, so we'll just, we'll make it. So Somebody said, you got to make sure you grab a water bottle, and I did. It's here somewhere, but that's okay. We're going to be good. So I'm going to pray and we're going to begin our message today. We're talking about, I, I told the band this morning, real cheery, happy subject today. We're talking about suffering. Uh, so um, it'll, it'll be very uplifting, I hope. No. It, I, I believe that God is going to use this, and this is part of what we're talking about as we live in community with one another. So let's pray before we begin. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for who you are, for what you do, for how you work in our lives, how you speak to us from day to day. And now as we come to open up your word and to study, Lord, I pray that you would continue speaking to us and guiding us. Help us to understand the truth about suffering, Lord, because we all suffer at different times and in different ways. We all struggle, we all have pain, we all have hurt, and we know that you're right there in the middle of it. And so we thank you for that and pray that you would use this day as a time of healing and help us to come together as a family. Because when one suffers, all suffer together. So be with us this morning as we study. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So again, this morning, we're, we're looking at, at suffering. And, and as, you, as you've experienced in life, we have a tendency, sometimes to a fault, <clears throat> we have a tendency to be drawn to people who are like us. Similar personalities, similar character traits, similar likes and dislikes, things that we are, thank you, sir, things that we are interested in, all those things are cause us to be drawn to one another. And, and so we make friends this way. People that like the same things become friends because they enjoy doing those same things together. In many ways, it's how we find our spouses because we, we have something in common with them. We are united together by the things that <clears throat> we have in, in common. And the beauty of this whole series that we've been talking about is that in Christ, we have the one thing that's truly important in common, and everything else kind of fades into the background. If we have Christ in common, that's all we need. We don't have to have anything else in common. But there's one other thing that unites us together as Christians and, and really as human beings, and that's suffering. We all suffer in different ways. To one degree or another, we all suffer. And it's possible that you have made friends with people because of that. You may have people that you've become friends with because you suffered through the same thing, the same illness or the same tragedy, and you bonded with somebody because of that. We all suffer in certain ways, and it's not just part of being a human. <clears throat> it's part of being a Christian. It's one of the most talked about topics in the New Testament is suffering. We don't like to talk about it a lot. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but it is part of who we are in Christ. And we don't like it. I don't think we're supposed to like it. I think it's okay to not like suffering, but it is part of who we are as human beings and as followers of Jesus. And if anyone tries to tell you, well, you know, when you become a Christian, all the suffering, all that stuff, you know, that goes out the window. Everything's great. Life is perfect. I don't know who that is telling you that, but they're lying to you because it's part of who we are. It's part of life. Everyone that walks this earth suffers to a certain extent. Now, the beauty is, as Christians, we have a distinct advantage because we don't suffer alone. We have brothers and sisters that walk with us through that suffering, and that's what we're, we're working toward today. And what we're going to do today is try to understand suffering from a biblical perspective, and to do that, we're going to read a ton of scripture today. So they're all going to be on the screen if you want to follow along in your Bible Feel free to jump around with us, but we're going to read a lot today, and I think that's a good thing because nobody came here to hear what I had to say. We just want to hear what God has to say. 
<clears throat> so the first thing we're going to look at, and we've already touched on this a little bit, is, is that suffering is part of life, just in general, not just as Christians, but life in general, suffering is part of it. And what one person considers suffering, somebody else may not. You may look at some, what somebody calls suffering and say, oh, you have no idea. But to them, it is suffering and it is a reality in their life. Even the person who seems to have everything, the person who is rich and famous, has every need in their life met, they're suffering in some way. I think the rich young ruler is a great example of that. He's got everything, and he comes to Jesus knowing that something's missing. What must I do to be saved? I know something's missing. Everybody is suffering from something Emptiness, hopelessness, hurt, physical or emotional or, or otherwise. Everyone is dealing with some sort of suffering because it's part of life. And there's one reason that suffering is part of life, and that reason is sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin came into the world, and along with it came suffering. And we see that in Genesis. I'm going to read Genesis chapter 3 a few verses there that show us what happened when sin entered the world. <clears throat> this is what God said to Adam and Eve. Verses 16 through 19. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return." Doesn't sound really pleasant, does it? <coughs> life's hard. Life's difficult, and that's why. Sin came into the world, and things got hard. Ladies who have had children or plan to have children, sorry. They're, it's painful, that's why. Keep that in mind as you encounter people in your everyday life. They're suffering because of sin coming into the world insecurity and doubt and anxiety and depression and hopelessness and feelings of worthlessness and a lack of purpose, illnesses and diseases and grief, all of these things came into the world because of sin and all of us suffer to one degree or another with these things. It's part of life. Secondly, though, we have to understand it's part of the Christian life. There are false teachers out there who try to convince you when you become a Christian, all that stuff magically disappears and it's just, you know, sunshine and puppy dogs and everything's great all the time. That's not the way it is. I have a feeling if you hear somebody teach that, go ahead and, and give them a Bible. Ask them to read it. Because when we open up the New Testament especially, we see suffering is part of who we are as Christians. Because Christ suffered, we suffer. It's a part of who we are in Christ. This is what scripture says, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be, but will be. Philippians 1, 29 and 30 says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here that I still have. It's been granted to you to suffer. It doesn't sound like something you want granted to you, but that's part of who we are in Christ. 1 Peter 4, <clears throat> 12 through 19 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. The fiery trial. Again, doesn't sound pleasant, but here's what he says, verse 13 but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. <clears throat> In the New Testament, there are over 80 mentions of the word suffer and suffering. And that doesn't count the times where it says trials and persecution and other things. Just the word suffer over 80 times. Does that change our attitude towards suffering? Sometimes we think suffering is a sign that we're doing the wrong thing when really it might be a sign that we're doing the right thing. In those early days of the church, the term Christian that we use was coined as an insult. You may have heard this story before, but they thought it would be an insult because it means little Christ. And, and the, the enemies of the church said, well, that's, a, that's the biggest insult we can make, to associate them with this guy who was stripped naked and beaten and hung on a cross. When the church heard that, and they said, yeah, this is great. I want to be identified with him. That's a perfect name. They wanted to be associated with Christ in every way, and even if that meant suffering for his name. Philippians 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, he wants to know him, know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He says, I want to know him in his sufferings. Colossians 1, 20, 24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I mean, how many times have you gone through suffering in your life and said, I rejoice, right? That's not a very common thing. But when we suffer for the sake of Christ, we can rejoice in it. Now, <clears throat> I'll say this. It doesn't mean we have to enjoy it. it. doesn't mean we have to like it. It doesn't mean we can't pray and ask God to take it away but it means that we have the ability to have joy even in the midst of our suffering because we understand suffering as a Christian, suffering for being a Christian is not a punishment because we're not doing it right. Suffering is part of following Jesus. The third thing we see in scripture is that suffering has a purpose. When we suffer for him, we can be comforted by the fact that there is a purpose. It is leading to something. Now, to be honest, that may not help very much. In the middle of it, when you're struggling through the darkest days of your life, it may not help to say, well, in the end, well, right then you're not so worried about the end. But it helps us beforehand to understand God is working something out through our suffering. And you've probably experienced that. If you've been through a major trial in your life, You've suffered through something, a loss that you never planned for, or never imagined, a, an illness that you walked through or maybe you're walking through right now. You've gone through that and you come out the other side and you look back and you say, man, God really used that. I don't want to do it again, but God really used that. And we see that happen all the time. If nothing else, coming through a major period of suffering in your life gives you hope and assurance you can survive the worst. You can make it through. There's this, this quote that's kind of made me laugh. This is a quote from uh, G.K. Chesterton. And he said, Fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. And suffering is real. It's there. But when we have gone through it, we can look back on the other side and say, I can beat that. I can make it through that. There is a purpose in suffering, but it's more than just surviving it. It's what God does in that. 
And that's where we look to Scripture. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We rejoice because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. There's purpose in suffering. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Easier said than done, right? Count it all joy. But why? Verse 3, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering and trials have their purpose, endurance, character, hope, steadfastness, or perseverance and completion in God. If you're in the middle of suffering through something right now, look for the glimpses of what God is doing in you through that. It may not be pleasant but God is working in you through that. You don't have to like it, but until you come out on the other side, look for those signs of what he's doing in your life because suffering has a purpose. Number four, we understand from scripture that suffering is temporary. I'll tell you a little story. Those of you who've been to camp have experienced this, but most years at camp we go repelling and you've probably seen pictures of of our rappelling trips. And when we go, you know, the bus parks down at the road and we go up this gravel road and uh, any, from our campers, any guesses on how long that is? You know, like 20, 30, 50 miles. Seems forever. Up this gravel road. So steep, you have to have mountain climbing gear. 250 degrees outside. Miserable. It's not that bad. But every year we go, we have, especially the newer students who haven't been before, have only been once or twice, they continue to ask, how much further is it? And they haven't, most of them haven't caught on yet that when I answer, it's just around that next curve. I'm probably not being completely honest because it's never right around the next curve. When we're in the middle of suffering and we can't see the end of it, It seems like it's never going to end. That hike, by the way, is about a mile. Takes like 30 minutes. Katie did it eight months pregnant and beat some of the campers up. So if you're going to camp this year and you're going to complain about it, keep that in mind. But when we can't see the end, it seems like there is no end. It's just going to go on forever and ever and ever. But we have to understand There is an end because suffering is temporary. I won't be sarcastic and annoying as I am with the campers and say, you know, your suffering is is meaningless and, you know, it's not that bad because it is that bad. But I will tell you based on what scripture teaches, it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. 1 Peter 5 verse 10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Man, when you're in the middle of that trial, it doesn't seem like a little while. But that's what scripture says. After a little while, God's gonna do what? He's gonna restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Suffering is temporary. You may be in the middle of it now and you're looking and hoping the end is right around the next curve, And you come around the next curve and there's just more. And it's just steeper and hotter. But there is an end. Suffering is temporary. But not just is it temporary in time, but it's limited in its power over us. If you remember the story of Job, God allowed Job to be tested. 
But God was in control. He was the one that said, there's the line, you can't cross it. And in, in your suffering, God is the one who's in control and he's not gonna let it completely overtake you. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 says this, says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We're afflicted in every way. We are perplexed, we are persecuted, we are struck down, but we are not crushed. We are not driven to despair. We are not forsaken, and we are not destroyed. There is a limit, and God is the one that sets that limit, no one else. Be encouraged that he will not put more on you than you can bear. We also need to understand suffering is nothing compared to the glory to come. That's why the temporary nature of suffering is bearable because we know there's something better to come. That doesn't minimize it. That doesn't mean your suffering is not that bad. It just means that the glory to come is so much greater, so much bigger. Romans 8, 18, Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It doesn't even compare. And I know you're sitting there thinking, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. But it doesn't compare. Paul also said this in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul says this light momentary affliction, and again you say, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. But I want to read this to you, and I don't have this in the, <clears throat> on the screens but that was Paul that said that, a light momentary affliction. Here's what Paul says later in that same book about his light momentary afflictions. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches." that is light and momentary in comparison to the full weight of glory. I'm sure you've been through things or you're going through things and you say, that's not light and momentary, but compared to what God has in store, that's exactly what it is. And the final thing we see in scripture, and this is, this is where we're aiming today, this is our point, we do not suffer alone. As followers of Jesus, as Christians, as a church, we need to understand that these trials, these things that we suffer, we were never meant to do this alone. We were not meant to be lone wolf sufferers going through life, struggling at it on our own. And you probably have experienced this. Think about the worst things you've been through in life and remember who was right there next to you. Could you have done it without them? Probably not. We go through a major illness, loss of a loved one, a financial disaster, marital issues, the inability to have a child, or having a child that is, becomes a wayward child. All those struggles, somebody was standing there with you. Could you have navigated those waters without them? We can't do it alone. We have this issue in the church, 
not just in our church, but I believe in all churches, where we feel like when we come to church, we have to put on a happy face. Now, we have masks, so we can, uh, we can cover that up a little bit these days, but we have this, this feeling that when we come to church and somebody comes up and says, how you doing? We have to say, I'm good, even if we're just dying inside. We don't have to do that. We wonder sometimes why the world looks at the church and says, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Maybe that's why. Because we just act like everything's great all the time, when, even when we're struggling. I got to say, that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees believed that blessing was equal to being spiritually right. That if you were doing things right, God was going to bless you. And if he wasn't blessing you, you were doing everything wrong. And I think we've adopted that to a certain extent where we feel like if somebody says, how you doing? And you say, I'm really struggling. I'm struggling in my faith. I'm in pain. Emotionally, I'm just worn out. If we do that, then somebody's going to think, well, they must be doing something wrong. Otherwise, God wouldn't allow that to happen. That's totally wrong. We all struggle. We all suffer. And we were not given a, a family of faith to show off how good we are and how spiritual we are. We were given a family of faith to walk through the good and the bad together. A few weeks ago, we talked about fellowship. And <clears throat> we said that true fellowship among believers is walking that narrow path together. And that means the good and the bad and the ugly. This is what scripture says, 1 Corinthians 12. It says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Listen to this. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Not some, all suffer together. Not just those closest to them. When, the, when a part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Now, you're going to have people that are closer to you that are, are going to feel that more deeply. But when you're hurting, we hurt as a body. When you suffer, we suffer. When you rejoice, we rejoice with you. You are not alone in your suffering unless you keep it to yourself. If you hide it and you bury it down and say, I'm good, then we can't suffer with you. 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the, for the gospel by the power of God. Share in suffering. And maybe you're thinking, I got enough suffering of my own. I don't need to share somebody else's. But the beauty is it goes both ways. They can share that load with you. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Scripture tells us to bear one another's burdens. It, it is, it's kind of a picture of a soldier. That, that phrase was meaningful in, in the, the Roman world because as a soldier, you had two things. You had a load and a burden. Your load, you carried yourself. That was what every soldier was supposed to carry. That was your own equipment. But if there was more to carry, that was a burden, and they shared that. One person didn't carry it all. So if you're suffering, share that burden with somebody else and then share their burden with you. And when all the church does that, it becomes bearable. This is what we see. This, is, this scripture sums it up, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, 
It is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Man, we suffer and God comforts us. And when God comforts us, we're able to comfort others when they suffer. That's how it works. When we've been through something, we can walk through that same thing when somebody else goes through it. I don't know what you're going through, but I'd be willing to bet there's probably somebody else in this room who's been through something similar who would love to walk with you through that and share that burden with you. God comforts us so that we can comfort one another. But how can we do it when we don't even know what somebody is struggling through? Share your burdens. We're going to close our time today with a time of prayer. And want to encourage you to pray for whatever you're struggling with and suffering with, for others in the church that you know are suffering. But I also want to invite you, if you're going through something right now, you're struggling, you're hurting, you're suffering, I'm going to be down here and others are going to be down here as well. We would love to pray with you for that. We can't take it away. We might not be able to, to fix the problem, but we can pray to the one who can and share that burden with you. So I want to encourage you, whatever it is you're struggling through, to come as we pray today and, and allow someone to pray over you. Or if you just want to come down here, as we've always said, these are just steps. This is just wood and carpet. Nothing special about it, but there is something special and there's something biblical about getting on your knees before the Lord. So if you have something you need to deal with God about, you're welcome to come down here. Come down here and pray with uh, one of the people that are down here. And then we'll close out our service by singing. So let's pray. Lord, we just call on you today. So many in this place are, are struggling, are suffering, are hurting, are confused, have anxiety and depression and want to know what on earth they're here for. And you have all those answers. And more than that, you've called us together as a family to walk through those things together, to struggle together to bear one another's burdens, to comfort one another with the comfort that you've given us. So Lord, we pray today that you would comfort those that are hurting. And as we spend a few minutes in prayer, Lord, I pray that you would just give them hope. And give them relief. I pray in Jesus' name. If you would stand and as you pray, if you would like somebody to pray over you, just please make some room and let anybody slip out and we'll be down here and would love to pray with you. And after that, we'll close out with a song. I want to read one last scripture to you and you can remain standing. Revelation 21, one through four. This is the ultimate hope for all of us. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God, Listen to this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither that shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Lord, we thank you that a day is coming when the former things will pass away. 
when the hurt and the struggle and the pain and the tears and the sickness will be no more. We praise you in advance for that day. We trust you that it is coming. But Lord, while we, while we are here, while we are still in this, these bodies, these tents, as Paul calls them, these temporary dwelling places, while we continue to hurt and struggle, we pray for your comfort through your Holy Spirit and through your word and through your children of faith. Help us to comfort one another, to bear one another's burdens, to walk with each other through the difficult times. Lord, as we close this service with a song, we recognize that Jesus, you alone save. You are our only hope. You are the only hope of salvation. You are the only hope of glory. You are the only hope for us to be there on that day when the former things pass away because you save. And we rejoice in that and we thank you for that. We sing this to bring glory to your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.